Welcome to the Optimal Bio Podcast. At Optimal Bio, we don't just balance your hormones, we balance your whole body. Our conversations range from nutrition to medicine with an emphasis on wellness tips to support your health journey. If you like what you hear, find us on the web at optimalbio.com and follow the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Hello and again, welcome to Optimal Bio's Wellness Podcast. Today, we're honored again to have Dr. Greg Brandon, founder of Optimal Bio, to talk to us today about estrogen. So, good afternoon, Doc. Uh, how are you doing, Jim? How are you doing? Doing well. Let's just go through the simple ABCs of estrogen. Um, from the most simple explanation, what is it? I mean, what does it do? Uh, everybody... It considers estrogen to be a woman hormone. It is not. It is a sex hormone that affects both men and women. Sex hormone is because it has to do with when we're inside the mommy's womb and how our, it's called our phenotype is expressed from our genotype. So it is a, 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 a gonadosteroid, but it has multiple functions. In a big class, it'd be called an anabolic steroid. It means it makes things grow. Catabolic means break things down. So it's anabolic steroid necessary for growth. Um, that's what estrogen does. There's an alpha receptor and a beta receptor. Alpha receptor is more of a proliferative. A beta receptor is more of a down regulation. Uh, how these things work, it's if people could picture a DNA, it's a uh, picture of the DNA in your head. That's that ladder that's rotated. That's our that's our, our it's our whole body's and from those DNA. That's our our computer program that unzips. The messenger RNA goes inside there, reads it goes what's called to a, a ribosome and then a transfer RNA to make an amino acid. And what te- uh, and that amino acid makes the protein structure. So what uh, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone do is they, uh, they, they initialize the transcription. That means they read the material and then they transcribe it to make the protein. That's which makes us crucial with life. All right, so thank you for that explanation. But I guess from a more simplistic form, um, you know, if you're a female, for example, um, you know, if your estrogen is normal, um, whether you're 20 years old or let's say premenopausal, what are some of the things, um, you know, a female, um, you know, w- would experience with, with normal estrogen levels? The, the big thing is there's th- four types of estrogen, E1, E2, E3, E4. E4 is made from the baby's liver, so we'll put that to the side. E3 is made from a placenta. Back to this alpha and beta receptor is important. E1 is a weak estrogen, but it's primarily a five to one ratio, a alpha growth. So it's a growth hormone. And that, mean, that means something in a moment. E2 is a one to one ratio. That's the most potent one. Then E3 is uh, made by placentas again. And that's a negative growth one. So it's let the baby grow, but not grow in things in, in the mother. So if you look at when your birth to, to when you pass away, there's menopause. E2 dominates when you're young. Again, the ratio of growth to, uh, to down regulation is a one-to-one. Important. In menopause, the E1 dominates, which is a five-to-one growth. What does that mean? Look at breast cancer. It happens when you lose your primary dominant hormone, the estradiol. The weaker one is more potent for potential growth. Um, Heart disease. Um, As you age, a woman's uh, heart attack risk in her younger age, her fertility rate is much less than a man's. At 65, it's equivalent to a man. Why again? She's lost her estrogen, her estradiol, which comes, by the way, from testosterone. Testosterone converts to estradiol, and that's what the benefits are in, in, with a youthful chemistry. So in a, in a woman's cycle, uh, if you miss make enough estrogen, then you will not ovulate and you'll miss your periods. In menopause, you lose the benefits, the other 400 functions that estrogen does to bone, to heart, to brain, to breast, to uterine lining, and all that stuff. So it depends where in their life cycle they are. But I really want people to understand this. When is most heart attacks, strokes, breast cancer, dementia occur? It happens after the estradiol, the most potent estrogen stops. That's why women have a, a, between a three to five fold increase in dementia. They call it a critical window in the perimenopausal range because the brain is protected by uh, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. 
So this estrogen is sometimes no, uh, known as the uh, the reproductive hormone. Is that is that a fair assumption? One hundred percent. Because again, that is how our body controls ovulation. When estrogen level builds up from the egg and it reaches around, there's a levels around two to 400 picograms per deciliter. That's when this other hormone called LH turns on, which then releases progesterone. Progesterone in Latin means pro-growth, pro-gestation. And that's your second part of the cycle. So that's when the baby is, uh, keeps the baby sustained and into the baby's placenta takes over. If you're not pregnant, the, the drop of the progesterone causes your next cycle to occur. But it's all initiated by estrogen getting high enough to cause the ovulation. So when you have uh, people that are, let's say, have too much est uh, estrogen uh, production uh, in, in their younger years, you know, what are some of the things that it can, can occur? The question again is if it's E1, E2, this is important because E1 predominates in adipose tissue. And the more E1 you have, the more adipose tissue, visceral fat, belly fat you could go. And then if that gets so high, it can actually shut down your own production of E2, which therefore you want to ovulate. So a lot of um, we call it, uh, estrogen domination can be from high sugar levels. It's called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which would then shut your own E2 going up because your E1 is so high and you won't ovulate. So missing cycles, uh, uh, fertility rates, that could be an issue of having too much dominant of estrogen versus the balance of the progesterone. And then why do you, why does a female go into menopause? Like why does that happen? Well, God's in charge. So there's a fertility window there. So, um, and this is important. I love that, Jimmy, you brought that up because we equate estrogen and testosterone, progesterone as fertility hormones, which they are. So when a woman stops making those, it almost appears like their value is not worth anymore because of the other four functions they do, we'll get into that a little bit later. So there's a, that's just a window of their time for fertility. And that's what those hormones do for that. Besides making bone, protecting heart and everything we still talk about. So why? When, when a mom, when a baby, a woman, a, a female baby's inside the womb is when all these cells are growing. So a baby's, a fetal uh, ovary has about 20 million eggs. And that's what makes estradiol predominantly from testosterone to estradiol. And when the baby's growing in the womb, when the baby's born, it has about 7 million eggs. When puberty starts, it has about uh, a million eggs. I, mean, I don't know if you guys remember uh, in for bio, uh, biology, mitosis and meiosis. The eggs go, it's called meiosis. So what happens is they just atrophy. They, they just try to keep the healthy eggs there. And then every month, about four of these eggs battle it out. And the bigger one that month becomes the one that ovulates. And that's just a time frame. So when those good eggs stop initiating the brain from working, then that's when menopause occurs. It's a, it's a transition over a few years in the 40s. So it's an, it's the aging of an egg, Jim. I'm sorry I got so detailed there. It's the aging of the egg. And then the, um, okay, I understand that a little bit better now, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the, and how does the body make estrogen? Does it come from testosterone? Yes. So the brain, it's called the hypothalamic pituitary gonad axis. The brain called the hypothalamus talks to another part of the brain called the anti pituitary, and that makes what's called gonadotropin releasing hormones, and that makes gonadotropins. That then tells the organ, in this case, we'll use the ovary, to make an egg, to make the egg, to make the egg mature. So you would, how it does is it starts by testosterone being made first, which then converts into estrogen, and that's how it's made. And then the estrogen, when it gets to its level, causes the ovulation to occur, and then that releases the progesterone. And that cycles pretty much every 28 days. Um, and that's what's very important is that regulation. Under stress, it becomes deregulated because in a stressful situation, survival is more important than reproduction. Obviously, and you know, we talked earlier in various podcasts about uh, everybody's testosterone levels going down um, in the last 30 to 40 years you know, due to environmental, uh, the environmental impact on foods and plastics and everything else. Um, and are we seeing that effect on, uh, you know, premenopausal females as well? No, what's happened is, Jim, is we actually have an increased estrogen because we have an increase in, uh, in, in sugar, which leads to an increase in another uh, androgen called androgen cyan, which converts that E1. So we're having, having more E1 from adipose tissue. The ovary has this 
It's finite amount. It's, it's not gonna have to make more or less. It's for the baby purposes. Uh, but the extra one that can cause the polycystic ovarian syndrome, the adipose, the irregular cycles, that's coming from another androgen converting to another estrogen. And that's the problem. So the, the culprit of all that, Jim, is um, with our government started pushing the food pyramid because extra sugar is the culprit to all of this. When we have a high fat, high protein diet with good complex carbohydrates, the hormones stay balanced. Okay, so I'm a little confused. So you got a little scientific on me there. So if testosterone is lower in everybody, you're saying that estrogen then is increasing and it's primarily increasing due to the fact that uh, our the food pyramid, sugars, you know, carbohydrates in general that aren't complex um, are basically affecting the body in a way where estrogen has increased and therefore causing other problems. Um, walk us through the whole sugar thing and walk us through how that happens in a very unscientific way. If you turn my thing, well, I got my wall right here. There are two, I, I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna, there's a thing called androgen. The most common androgen is testosterone. There's two androgens, testosterone and androstyone. They both convert to estrogens, okay? Testosterone converts to the estradiol, which is the potent one when you're young. The androstyone converts to the estrone, which is supposed to predominate when you're menopausal. That's the one that can increase with the high sugars. And that's the one that causes more of the ob obesity and overweight and visceral fat. So the confusion was there's two androgens. So we're still losing overall testosterone in women as well because they're losing the same way because they're ingesting fake estrogens just like the males and that's down-regulating their production of their testosterone but also it actually increases more of the androstyone which then in increases their the, the E1, the one you don't want to have. So it's two different pathways. So then where do some OBGYNs prescribe birth control pills for some of these ailments? Um, not to prevent pregnancy, but to, you know, regulate estrogen, I guess. Um, if a woman is pregnant, they're not cycling. Why are they pregnant? Well, what's hormonally happened when they're pregnant? It's their highest estradiol levels, the highest testosterone levels, and the highest progesterone levels in their life. When you have it so high, you don't have your cycle anymore. So what the pill does, it mimics pregnancy. So what it does, it has a a synthetic estrogen called ethylene estradiol and a synthetic progestin, depending on what pill it is, um, that, mim that, that they're potent enough to trick the body that you're pregnant so you don't ovulate. So if you're having irregular cycles and uh, sugars, you want to lose weight over time, but you want to you want to turn the cycle off. So you don't. The side effects of having irregular cycles are heavy periods, lead to anemia, cramps, things like that. So if you could turn everything off while they're not trying for a baby, that helps them. Their symptoms go away, but not the cause. Then the cause would be, you know, hopefully get balanced with their um, their diet, their sleep, their nutrition. But also the problem is, Jim, is those also turn off the production of testosterone. And testosterone is the euphoria, the libido, the burn fat to build muscles, like this vicious cycle, because you're turning that off. When you look at a birth control pill person, you check their laboratories, it actually looks like they're in menopause because they're not making their own hormones. But it, but it tricked the body, so you get some of the some of those, they are good for some of those symptoms, Jim. And then if you did go off that premenopausal, would your body start making everything it's supposed to make again? If, if, the, if the reason why you're irregular in the first place has been fine-tuned, yes. Okay. All right, so let's fast forward to menopause. Um, you know, I read a lot about how important estrogen is for heart health, cardiovascular health. And I guess there were some studies uh, in the past that um, – you know, question the the, uh, the safety, I guess, of or the cardiovascular health if um, with with some of these estrogen treatments. And I know there's different ones, um, but it looks like it's coming back around now where they're recognizing that um, estrogen is vital to heart health. Can you kind of walk us through the history of that and you know some of the studies that you've read about in the past? 
It's interesting, from 1935, the first study on hormones given to a woman was actually testosterone pellets on women who had hysterectomies because they understood that a woman in her 20s makes 50 times more testosterone than estrogen. So the pellet was testosterone and then replaced, they knew it converted to estrogen. From that to the famous paper in 2002, virtually every major paper said there are benefits to the heart and to the brain and no increase in breast cancer. Um, even with synthetics, Jim, even with synthetics. And then uh, the paper in 2002, the famous WHI paper came out uh, that said hormones cause breast cancer. It was very interesting. They did not use estrogen, Jim. They used Premarin, which is an equine estrogen, which is a, ho a horse estrogen. And back to our E1 and E2, equine estrogens also have more estrone in them. And E1 again is five to one more pro growth. So that was the estrogen in the, in the study. In the progesterone in the study, it wasn't progesterone, it was a progestin called medoxyprogesterone. Again, synthetic, different structure. And they found the arm of the women who took just Premarin by themselves with no uterus and no Provera, they did not have an increase in breast cancer, but they had an increase in blood clots, but a decrease in osteoporosis and a decrease in colon cancer. In the arm that had both, it had a 24% increase in, in breast cancer. So the next day in the news was hormones cause cancer. Jim, they weren't hormones. I called the most famous OB in the world at the time and asked about the study. And he goes, you're right, Greg, this is a crappy study. And we went through why scientifically. So a guy in France, this is in our book, The Hormone Handbook, Fear Nero did a study with 134,000 women. He gave them bioidentical estradiol and natural progesterone decrease breast cancer 10% because it's a youthful chemistry. Then in the other arm, he uh, gave a natural, progest natural estrogen with synthetic progestin, Provera again. That arm increased breast cancer 69%. The culprit is not estradiol. The culprit is the, progest the, the, the progestin, medoxyprogesterone, because it, it, it down-regulated the protective aspect. Natural progesterone down-regulates the, the estrogen receptor in the breast tissue, so it actually decreases the absorption of it. And again, estradiol is a one-to-one -one ratio growth. Estrone is a five-to-one growth. And so therefore, that study was been skewed since then. But even, even the women who had the breast cancer in that study, they, they looked back 15 years later, Jim, they actually said it still protected uh, the heart and, um, and brain. So keeping a youthful chemistry protects the heart. That's why that one, pa that one paper has just been, it's just ruined women's lives. Hopkins looked back and said, the women who stopped hormones, it probably costs around 19,000 lives a year because they increase heart attacks, stroke. So... Walk us through again the difference between a, uh, a natural therapy and a synthetic therapy. Like, why can't the synthetics just match the natural? Okay. So, an organic molecule means it's made in nature. We're talking about human organics. So, there's a three dimensional structure that our body makes. I want to get really clear on this how, how important that is. People may hear about a red, a red blood cell looks like a donut, sickle cell looks like a sickle, like a crescent moon. There's two major protein moieties together, an alpha and a beta, they hook together. One amino acid, just one change in the beta at the sixth amino acid changes the structure from a disc to a sickle. That's how important by changing one amino acid can change in this or one or one uh, or add a different carboxyl group. It's, that's how important. The 3D uh, structure is very, very, very important. So. Your body makes this structure, so your body knows how to utilize it, the potency of it, to metabolize it, and to eliminate it. Pharma companies cannot own a organic molecule. You have to manipulate it or make a synthetic one that then will have the same function, quote unquote. But it doesn't have the same potency, the same metabolism, the same elimination. That's where the complications happen, Jim. We talked about testosterone last week. There are three classes of synthetic testosterones and they have some short-term benefits, but long-term they have some detriments. Same thing with the estrogens. When you have estrogens, 
that are synthetic, they can increase blood clots. Natural does not. Also, the route matters, Jim. If you take it orally, it must go to the liver. The liver also produces the clotting mechanism. So the simple thing is a bioidentical literally mimics the exact structure, atom for atom, molecule for molecule, three-dimensional row as our body makes. So therefore, your body thinks, the Mayo Clinic calls, it recognizes it as same, not as foreign. That's what bioidentical means. Okay. So tell us, obviously you've been treating females through your OBGYN practice for, you know, 30 plus years and, you know, you've continued doing male and female, you know, for the last, uh, you know, eight years or so with uh, optimal bio. Um, kind of give us some case studies, some, uh, you know, some patient stories that, um, you know, you, you, you know, came across and, and you, you helped treat and, and had successful outcomes. Yeah, the big one that got me in this whole thing, Jim, was in, in, you know, say 25 years ago was young, healthy, 25, 35 year old women um, complaining of decreased libido and tiredness at those young ages. And that's what got me in the whole idea of testosterone women, because in America, we don't consider, you know, if we replace hormones in America, we replace them with synthetics over a short period of time, five years but they only replace estrogen or testosterone. There is one called ester test, ester test half strength, which has 17 methyl testosterone in it, which we've known since 1947 increases blood clots, but it's still the one that's approved. So in those women's symptoms, looking on the data and then looking back at older ranges is where we found our ranges to get women in optimal testosterone levels. Early on, when they're younger, Jim, the key is to balance the progesterone so they don't, don't become estrogen dominant. So the, the success rates to have women just be themselves in the sense of when they're, they're the big thing, every comes to us, they're either tired and or brain fog or decreased libido. And we see response when the levels become youthful chemistry on that. Um, the, also, the big one, Jim, is, is for the long term is the perimenopausal. By strict definition, menopause is one year of no periods. But the laboratory change, what's called the FSH, when that level creeps up above 2023, that also leads to to be menopausal. So you can have periods, have episodes of having menopausal ranges, and that's where the effects of hot flashes could occur. Uh, But when that means is, uh, Harvard did a paper two years ago, hot flashes uh, are not just a a, a nuisance. They've actually, women with hot flashes have a 200 increase in heart attack. But why? Because estrogen, estradiol, protects the endothelial lining. We start losing that, the thermoregulatory part of the brain, which is controlled by estrogen, is just a symptom. But at what's happened at the cellular level is our lining becomes stiffer, becoming not as pliable. At the same time, they're losing bone and vaginal tissue and uh, you know, bladder tissue. So it's a, it's a, it's a. These cells are not being optimized anymore. But the, I, the, what I really want to focus on is that critical window in the perimenopausal age is that estrogen, testosterone, progesterone protect the brain. It's called neuroplasticity. And we use this so dramatically, that's one of the hypotheses of why women have a higher risk of dementia. Yeah, I read somewhere today where uh, they've debunked you know, the original plaque study of years ago, and now they're saying that um, Alzheimer's potentially could be an autoimmune disease. Yeah, Jim, it's interesting. When you look at the um, Alzheimer's, there's a guy named Christopher Exler from um, uh, Cambridge. Who's up, he's, he's, the, he's the aluminum expert of the world, especially is, is uh, autism and Alzheimer's. And the reason why they put uh, aluminum into vaccines is because the virus particle they put in it is not strong enough to cause a, re, a, re, a re, immune response. So putting this added adjunct to it on aluminum, we know causes toxicity. So back to the Alzheimer's, they're finding Alzheimer's patients have a higher aluminum content in the cortex of the brain. That's one thing, but why? Back to you. It's the inflammation. So when the inflammation causes that, also sugar causes inflammation, glucose um, causes the 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 spin the, uh, the tangle of the neurons. Fructose does that seven times more than that. So it's all inflammation disease, which means electrons are in pairs. When one is by itself, that's called a free radical, which leads to the inflammatory process. So in any itis, that's what this occurring. So the Alzheimer's appears if we could decrease decrease the inflammation, uh, that could help maybe decrease the neuron damage. And one of the biggest culprits, Jim, is sugar because sugar is actually called, Alzheimer's is called type three diabetes because of the hyperglycemia as well, which causes an inflammatory state. So yes, inflammation has many causes, but the ultimate chemical reaction is the free radicals. We wanna decrease that in any type of uh, inflammation. 
So what's the difference between fructose, glucose, let's say, and sucrose? I know sucrose is sugar. Uh, they're all probably sugars, right, eventually. But, you know, for our audience, what's the difference between the three of them? Okay, glucose and fructose together, combined together, is sucrose. Okay, that's called a disaccharide. Glucose and fructose are a saccharide. They're by themselves. They're not bound together. Okay. So they have, they're dissolved in a different process. Uh, glucose has six carbon ring. It gets broken in half, which becomes three, uh, three carbons in each. That becomes energy. Fructose has another pathway that goes to the liver. And it appears to be the actual cause of non-alcoholic liver failure is that the fructose is much harder to the system. It's also stickier. So by being stickier, uh, everybody may have heard of hemoglobin A1C. That's just because when there's extra sugar in the body, glucose, it has to stick to something and should, we can measure it on red blood cells. Well, fructose binds seven times more than that. So fructose is a type of sugar, type of ring. When it's in fruit, and you got to eat it and chew it and break up all the fiber. Completely different than high, uh, high fructose corn syrup, which is concentrated just to the max. In fact, they've shown that high fructose corn syrup, when you drink it, I eat sodas, it actually makes colon cancers grow because that part of the colon should never see a fructose. It could see a sugar molecule via, via the bloodstream, but not inside the gut. So fructose, that the way they concentrate it is, is terrible for our body. And I think, you know, to the food systems, I guess, credit to some extent, they've, you know, reduced some of this high fructose corn syrup and, you know, a number of brands, but obviously it's still out there. Um, and that also obviously leads to ultimate, that leads to weight gain as well, correct? Yeah, the big one too is, is not just that, Jim, but believe it or not, it's also omega-6 fatty acids, which are in seed and, uh, and uh, vegetable oils. Uh, there's a great paper showing that it might be the hardening of the artery. This is another hypothesis. It's not extra glucose. Um, Dr. Miller and Dr. DeBakey, two of the most famous heart surgeons of the world, they said blaming cholesterol for atherosclerosis is like blaming a fireman's that has to put your fire out. Cholesterol is actually like the band-aid coming in for the damage. What's causing the damage? What's causing the damage is the high sugar content, back to free radicals again, because atherosclerosis, Dr. Mark Houston um, in, in Nashville calls it an inflammatory disease. Because again, inflammation, then you keep your body's immune system comes in and attacks it, and that's causing the scar tissue. One great theory is on this is that uh, Roundup uh, glyphosate is causing the endothelial lining to become damaged. And the heart tissue, in particular arteries, it's not in veins, it's in arteries, need to have sulfur to come in there. And sulfur keeps the friction, uh, the viscosity smooth. And cholesterol is the agent that grabs it and brings the sulfur to the cells so the cells can use it. So when the heart is having damage, it's saying, bring me more cholesterol because it expects to have the, the, the sulfur in it. We have a low sulfur diet now because of the Roundup in our body. Um, it's in egg yolks. They've told us not the egg yolks. It's in a lot of garlic. There's a lot of things that have told us not to eat sul not these. We're losing our sulfur content. So it's just so complex, Jim, is that's why I go back to the basics. Eat fat, eat protein, some complex carbohydrates in a proper area to decrease inflammation. 90% of our food, Jim, is not here from 100 years ago and 90% of the diseases we had 100 years ago weren't there either. I think even the hardcore um, doctors out there that are you know, promoting um, you know, certain medications for cardiovascular disease you know, said that you know, ultimately inflation, inflation, <laughs> inflammation is, uh, is the primary culprit. And then when every, all the other, because the, there's so much inflammation that as everything else flows through, it basically, you know, becomes potentially it becomes clogged and you have blockages and then suddenly you have heart attacks at some point in time. Back to estrogen, one of the number one anti-inflammatories in our body is estrogen. One of the first lines of it. All types or? Uh, well, again, on inflammation, E1, E2, E3 are yes. For proliferative growth, that's different. We get really nerdy because there's an alpha receptor and a beta receptor that I talked about, like in prostate cancer for men, it's the it's the it's not low, it's not low high testosterone, it's low testosterone, high estrogen alpha receptor because in the prostate gland men should not have aromatase which converts into estrogen if they do for environmental reasons then the problem is you make sure if you have more beta receptors you're protected young men have more beta receptors in the prostate versus the alpha receptors so that gets nerdy but alpha receptor beta receptor the future that's really specific in how we take care of these hormone levels testosterone and, and um, testosterone high levels is actually protective of endothelial lining and growth of prostate so I saw something, and I'm just going to 
paraphrase it uh, since we're on the podcast um, from the Mayo Clinic. And it talked about, you know, menopausal women having lower estrogen, which potentially could lead to heart attacks. And the solution was to uh, eat a low, cor- low cholesterol, uh, heart healthy diet and do plenty of exercise. And what do you say to that? Because I, I listened, watch that and I'm thinking to myself, you know, you've been talking a lot about how important cholesterol is to the body. And there was nothing in that solution that, that talked about um, creating more estrogen, basically, to protect the heart so, and to reduce inflammation. So what would you do? Two things. Uh, uh, cholesterol, um, I got a great book here called Fat and Cholesterol Don't Cause Heart Attacks and Stats on a Solution. Dr. David M. Diamond, please Google that YouTube. It goes through the history of statins. That's number one. Number two, our liver makes roughly 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams of cholesterol every single day. The famous Framingham study uh, from 1950 till now, they've looked at every, you know, this is the largest population series ever done. This is, a, this is really crazy. For every one milligram per deciliter of cholesterol that you decrease, you increase overall mortality 11%. Why? Because cholesterol is the first line of, of uh, fight inflammation. But back to your stuff with the estrogen. Cholesterol becomes estrogen. Cholesterol becomes testosterone. That's why it's very important we understand what it is. It's 85% of your heart. It's about 95% of your brain. It's 100% of every sex hormone. So back to this with the Mayo Clinic. If we had the same study, turn things around. Hey, we have more diabetes because we lose this insulin. The treatment would be give insulin. Okay? Uh, the study is... We have more thyroid disease because we lose thyroid hormone. The treatment would be give thyroid hormone. The, we lose uh, testicles or ovaries. In women, oh, this, in this case, we look at uh, ovaries, losing uh, the estradiol, the most potent one, uh, give low cholesterol. Uh, why not give estradiol? And knowing this is important because, Jim, remember, women still make estrone, but that's the most that's the most prominent one. Why do women have less heart attacks or stroke and dementia prior to menopause? It's because of the protective aspect of estradiol. It causes endothelial smoothness, causes the integument of the artery to be smoother. It's beneficial. It's a youthful chemistry. And I don't like hearing your hormones for your age. How about hormones for your health? That, to me, is what's optimal. We do not say... This is good for your age blood sugar. This is good for your age thyroid. We only do it for sex hormones. And that does not make sense to me because sex hormones have you know hundreds of functions outside of fertility. I know we keep asking this question, but and I'm still searching for the right answer. Why doesn't the medical community recognize that? Jim, I, I don't know because I, I have to be trained by the man who uh, wrote the book Gynecology. Four men wrote it. He's one of the lead authors on it. And he always taught us give hormones for the benefit, the protection of the heart and the brain. He did not think bioidentical was superior and synthetic. He thought they were the same. I'm not arguing that point. But he always said, we replaced it. I was trained to replace it. When that 2002 paper came out and you looked at the data, and now you look back retrospectively, it was, a t- it was a crummy paper. Jim, I don't know how, I can't get at people's intentions. I don't understand it. Because when you look at the data, it just, I'll give you, back to you brought to the heart and cholesterol. There's not one single cholesterol study lowering statins that's been proven to be beneficial in women. Not one in women. Some on men who've had previous heart attacks, it may decrease. Most likely, it's anti-inflammatory procedure, not its loan of its cholesterol procedure. So I don't have an answer for it, Jim. I don't want to get into motives. Uh, I'm just trying to look at the body. Is when we were our best, 18 to say 25, why not keep our blood sugar that level, keep our thyroid that level, keep our waist that level, keep our uh, blood pressure that level, keep all the things at that level. But the thing that correlates and ties all those together are our sex hormones. And that's why I believe we look at that range. And in optical bio, we don't. We try to look at the pre-plastic and the pre-roundup era. What were the ranges 30, 40, 50 years ago? The data we get from Travis and other studies, that's our guidepost. Because today we have a sick population being bombarded by the roundups, the high fructose, the statins, that these values are, are skewed. So I believe it's important to go, what is a good value? I know I use this a lot, Jim, but if we were looking for what's a healthy blood sugar and you have 100,000 people in the study and all different ages, both genders, da, 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 but they're all were diabetic, the results are irrelevant. And we're having a sick population check hormone levels. You know, we have, we have, you know, I think we placed around 20,000 patients the last 10 years. We're seeing objective data. So I don't, I don't have an answer for you, Jenna. So a roundabout way, but I think it was very slow to move. Um, I, the guy's name starts with an S. I forgot his name. 
Um, no, excuse me. This is Lister. Lister said we should surgeons who wear gloves in surgery. He lost his license. He said, you're insane. 30 years later, gloves became standard. Sometimes just changing things makes people go. Um, I'm not anti-medicine in America. You're hit by a car, high-risk delivery, uh, need a kidney transplant, hope you're in America. But I think we've missed the idea of what health is. And health is this beautiful machine could do a lot of things if these stress factors are off and the right hormone levels are present. Yeah, I'm just going to go down the cholesterol road, road one more time. Uh, a friend of mine the other day went for a physical and got his labs done. And um, he's not on statins now, but he was on statins about four years ago. And uh, he was telling me that uh, his, you know, if you believe the HDL and LDL, you know, HDL is good for you, the LDL is not um, theory. Um, when he was on statins, it basically knocked down his HDL level and his LDL levels. Um so I'm thinking to myself, well, if that's what statins do, then how is that good for the body if every doctor is telling you your HDL levels need to be as high as possible? Okay, this is important. The liver makes cholesterol. The liver sends it to the cells. Which cells need cholesterol? Every single cell in your body needs cholesterol. It makes up at least 50% of every cell membrane. Number one, when it goes there, it's in the LDL form mainly. Now, cholesterol is oil. Blood is water. Oil and water don't mix. So the cholesterol must be wrapped up in what's called a lipoprotein. Those are called particles. When it goes to the organ and comes back to the liver, then it's HDL. This is Mark Houston's book is phenomenal on this. It's uh, beautiful. He wrote a book called Personalized and Precision Integrative Cardiovascular Medicine. And it's not the as LDR or, or uh, HDL. It's how many particles you have. The higher particles you have, more chance that cause damage. What do you mean by particles? It's if you're a passenger in an Uber and the Uber runs into the, uh, into the, into the side of the road, is the passenger the problem or the Uber? It's the Uber, right? That's the driver. That's what this is as a passenger. So the more particles you have, more damage could occur. What causes particle number? Sugar, inflammation. Now, that all being said, Japanese study in 2015, when the largest series done, the study by Nanza here, uh, N-H-A-N-E-S, looked at this. Here's the interesting data. The higher one's LDL is, the higher one's total cholesterol is, decrease overall mortality. Okay, this is not me, this is not, this is me just reading these papers. So when I hear this stuff, again, I can't, if you want to read a book, please, I'll show it to you guys. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, it's by... Uh, Paul Roche, MD, uh, and fat and cholesterol don't cause heart attack and statins are not the solution. A great review of that book is by Dr. David Diamond, who wrote a chapter of this book. It's a YouTube video. It's been out there for about four or five years. He's from a PhD from University of South Florida, tells a story. Please just don't listen to a word Jim and I are saying. Please go to your research. But my thing with cholesterol is this. If your liver makes it every single day, and then when, when you eat egg yolks, you can't absorb it unless it's estrophized. It's all biochemistry. So, Jim, your answer is why? I don't know, Jim. I don't know. Plus, I would think the LDL will, LDL will be more important than the HDL because the LDL is carrying the cholesterol to the cells. 100%, Jim. So, if it can't get to the cells, then what good is it? Right, right. And there's a thing called familial hypercholesterolemia where you don't have enough receptors to grab it, LDL receptors, and they don't have a higher death rate. Um, and the study in, I mean, really crazy. There was never a study that says statins lower cholesterol. It was colstriamine, which is a, um, it's a bile binding agent where you orally take it because, um, when you have a cholesterol in your liver, in your GI tract, it recycles. And if you take colstriamine, you lower cholesterol and they showed it. And you ready for this one? <laughs> it all came from what they, 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 they serve people high cholesterol diet and found them having increased plaque. No, that was not the study. They fed rabbits who are herbivores. They never saw cholesterol. That's who stored. That's where the first studies came from. It was in rabbits. Seriously? Uh, I'm, yeah, I know. 
please, everybody, please watch Dr. Damon, uh, David Diamond, D- David M. Diamond, PhD's videos, please. And the references in this book, it's insane. Please. Let's get back to, uh, to estrogen. Okay. It may, okay. 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 We talked about the heart, brain, a uh, bone, uh, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, make bone. Our body needs calcium to talk. So what you have to store that is bone. So every millisecond you're losing, gaining, losing, gaining, losing, gaining. In menopause, you stop making it and you stop saving it. When you, uh, if you go on estrogen uh, and testosterone bioidentical pellets, you don't lose 5% of bone mass per year. More women die of osteoporosis fit around 50,000 a year than breast cancer because they, their hip snaps, they break, they die of pneumonia. By the age of 70, 70% of women have broken vertebrae. If you go on pellets, this patient is from 1979, you gain 8.3% of bone per year. The biphosphates, the, the Fosamaxes, they make a hard, brittle bone that breaks hips and breaks jaws after five years. You want a strong, pliable bone like a youthful bone. And that's what bioidentical hormones do because all it is doing is mimicking what your body made when you're younger. So it's important. And I used to surgically fix the bottom of women the age, bladder fall down, things like that change. Well, that's only a change because those levels, those, those tissues down there need these hormones. You get the hormones, the bottom stays young again. It's just, it's just, it's not. It's just keeping a youthful, healthy chemistry. And this is what bothers me again, Jim, I bring it up all the time. We don't settle for a old blood sugar. We don't settle for an old uh, thyroid. We don't settle for uh, being older. I don't wear glasses. I won't do Lasix. We don't settle for that. And we could actually make, we don't have to invent anything. We just give the cells the fuel they need to stay young and kill off the bad cells called ap- uh, apoptosis. And that's what fasting does, Jim too it eats the bad cells and keeps the young ones there more healthy so this is not a fountain of youth this is to age gracefully no i understand that so a lot of people that don't go through any type of hormone treatment um doctors might prescribe you know calcium supplements and and other things are they helpful at all no, because you cannot absorb, you need what a thing called osteocytes to convert to osteoblasts. That makes bone. Then you need your vitamin D and your calcium to do that. If you have calcium, there's not being reabsorbed back in the bone and for bone formation, it floats in the blood. And where does it line up to? In the arteries. That's atherosclerosis. When you have inflammation, it, it, again, picture electron again, you have a free electron and, and calcium has an extra space. That's what binds it. That's what forms it so when you and i we go get a, a calcium score you can lie down have a cat scan take a picture of your heart and you can actually see where the calcium lays up that's the extra calcium going where damage was so you can actually reverse that with supplementation like um estrogen testosterone alpha-lipoic acid or things like that to slow that down or reverse that so yeah it, it, you don't need it if you're not taking the vitamin d the vitamin and and the uh, the hormones because it just floats around more And you talked the other day about having, making sure that everybody takes vitamin D3 because it has two Ks in it, correct? Which allows the D then to get into the bone. Otherwise, it just floats around in the blood and doesn't really, you know, absorb in the body. Yeah, vitamin D3 is a, the backbone of that's cholesterol. Okay, so it's, a, it's called a, it's called a seco anabolic steroid. So vitamin D e is a growth hormone. has over three thousand functions in our body, and it has um, uh, four mechanisms of fighting cancer. Number one, vitamin K. There's one, two, and seven. One affects the. It actually becomes the clotting molecules in our body. K two controls calcitonin or our calcium. So vitamin K2 allows it to be absorbed better and metabolized better. Plus you can't overdose because you have the proper calcium balance. That's what ca- that's vitamin K2 and K7 do. Got it. Got it. Anything else we should know about estrogen? Without estrogen, you and I are not here. Okay. And that I just, it's just so... I, it's like you remember the movie remember the titans and, and he runs a veer offense he goes it's like nova can you keep pound eventually work i think that's what we're going to do it's, it's not it's not complicated it's so complicated we can't wrap our hand around it but the simple part is what can we do keep the levels youthful 
And if it's the same structure your body makes, it knows how to utilize it at the right potency. It knows how to uh, eliminate it at the right pathway. And it knows how to excrete it, which, you know, how we excrete it out of our body. So metabolize it, utilize it, and excrete it. When the body gets a foreign hormone, a synthetic one, it gets confused in the potency, it gets fused in the mechanism, it gets fused in the elimination. We could avoid that. I believe that's where the bad presses happen. But when they say there's no difference, it's just a marketing tool, that's baloney. Because the reason why they're not making the same exact structure is they don't own it. Therefore, it's no value for it. So I just believe, I wanna hear the answer. When is it okay to have a bad sugar? When's it okay to have a bad thyroid? Let me know when those are because then I will have something in my mind to wrap around it. But I see no benefit of having abnormal levels that affect your sugar, affect your fat, affect your bone, affect your brain, affect your heart, affect your immune system. I do not, I don't see any benefit of being suboptimal. So let's talk about a couple of the either perceived or real, you know, side effects to you know, the natural bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, which then balances your sex hormones and your estrogen levels are good, your testosterone levels are good. First, hair loss in female, true or false? There's a great paper out of Matrius that looks at it and says the 10 fallacies of hormones, and that's one of them. Women, men, we lose 1% of our hair per year on hormones and not on hormones. I disagree with that paper from my clinical observation. I do see some women and some men it depends on the enzyme in their skin called 5 alpha reductase. There's a book called the, um, um, it's called, oh gosh, I'm blanking the name, but it has to do, it's why, why does uh, testosterone make hair grow everywhere in your body except the top of your head, okay? It's like, it, it, it's, it's a, just paradox response. So on the, the studies show no change, roughly 1% per year, period, we lose. But I find people when they first start it, your body may be shocked a little bit, and I do see it. But over time, it is a st- they're, they're, it's equal. But I do think as an initial, you can have it. But over time, I see some women hair get stronger. As long as you also balance, Jim, their T three. T three is a hair problem, and they work con- when they work synergistically. Hair is actually there is more is there. It's not going it's not going to cure genetic uh, you know loss of hair. That's genetic. Okay, so. Forgetting about the papers piece of it, just look at it from a practical perspective with all the females that you've treated at Optimal Bio uh, in the last eight years or so. Uh, has anybody come in with a full head of hair and, and left after a year with, with, with hair loss, significant hair loss? Zero. Zero. Someone like me coming in with no hair, I didn't grow hair. So I stayed the same also, right? You may grow it in your back. I guess we're going mine. But yes, again, it has to do with the enzyme and that, and that paradox response. But the, the answer is no, Jim. All right. Uh, breakthrough bleeding in females. Breakthrough bleeding. It's, okay. If you are a, mo- a postmenopausal woman, your uterus is 55 years old, we'll say. So now we're going to wake it up. And when we wake it up, we're going we're gonna to stimulate it by giving it estrogen because estrogen is going to do all its other benefits around the body. But it does stimulate the uterine lining to get thick. So then you give progesterone to negate that. The question is, is what number do you need to balance it. And we got to play with it. We have an algorithm. We get pretty close on it. But if you started the synthetics, they tell you within the first six, eight months, if you break through bleed, it's just part of restarting it. But bioidentical people freak out a little bit even though it's less cancerous. But here's the thing, Jim, is we, yeah, we, it, you, 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 I tell everybody they may bleed. How much would balance it? The higher I get the, the, the higher I can get their, their progesterone. In a woman who's cycling, a, a progesterone is called luteal phase. When it gets above three to 10, that's why they don't bleed during the luteal phase. I try to mimic that in our patients. Those who get higher have less chance to bleed. But those who continue to break through bleed will have a pathology. They'll have a fibroid or a polyp, or there's a thing called adenomyosis. By them having children, their uterus is not as good as holding blood. So there's gynecology, ultrasound that, and biopsy that, which you should never blow off. If that continues, we do that. But breakthrough bleeding can occur. We usually find uh, we find an answer is either structural or we balance with the hormone levels. But that will occur. But we do, I say 99, 95% don't have a problem once we balance it out. Some have said, you know, you get this and, you know, will you go back to having periods again? Will you go back to being reproductive? being able to reproduce at, you know, 57 to 60 years old. No, what's happening again, your body's uterus will think it's, it's all younger, but, but the ovaries can't make more eggs. 
All right. Now there are some people that do biological hormones like us, and they ha- and they make a woman have a cycle because there's some theories behind that you make a cycle so you mimic their their age. There's some validity to that. I find being a gynecologist, most women like to have the benefits without any periods. But there's a famous paper done about 40 years ago that showed post. Uh, uh, Dr. Moore wrote this paper. He wrote the book on on, col- on, on cancer, and he was looking at it because the standard of care is if you're postmenopausal and you bleed, you must have a biopsy. So his paper was how can we avoid the biopsy? Who can we skew out? He did ultrasounds on women postmenopausal. If their lining was less than five millimeters, the chance of cancer was zero. Okay. But the problem is now a lot of doctors use that five millimeters on women on hormones. Their hormones are not, they're not, that uterus is not a 60 year old uterus anymore. So that lining study does not pertain to them. But still, but to be compulsive, if you continue to bleed, get ultrasound, if that is not, if that's under five millimeters, even though that's not the actual number, then what you want to do is do a biopsy. That biopsy does two things, rules out the bad thing about one in a thousand cancer, and it tells us you have too much estrogen or too much progesterone, and we can balance that. So that's what we want to do on that. But the important part is to make sure that, yeah, you might break through bleed, explain everything that that, and explain why. Because the uterus now is a, is a 25-year-old uterus, that's not a 50-year-old uterus. And this is where sometimes people get confused. Used. But I don't need to have my, my levels younger because I'm older. That's again, then that's your belief. But I believe your body's healthier at a youthful chemistry. Yeah, especially when it comes to bone loss, heart health, and brain health, and everything else that's going on. Brain, exactly. Things that kill us. And look, you've addressed this already during the, the podcast, but we're just going to ask it one more time. Oh my God, if I get uh, hormone replacement therapy, I'm going to get cancer. Yeah, virtually about 80% of women who get breast cancer aren't on hormones, number one, okay? Number two, about 3% of women, let's go back to the numbers. In, in the 50s, America had about breast cancer rate about one in 20. Today, it's one in six. It's multifactorial. Uh, there are theories that it's genetic. There are theories that it might be hyperglycemic, high sugar, which causes my, a myocardial dysfunction, which causes a cell to change. But there's a couple of things. Japan's rate level is still one in 20. What are they different than ours? Their intake of iodine is 200 times higher than ours is now. We used to eat that much iodine 50 years ago. Iodine is crucial to support glandular cells, i.e. breast, prostate, kidneys, things like that. So at Optimal Bio, we make sure that we, we, get, we get iodine levels up to the optimal ranges. It was about 15 to 25 milligrams. It was a regular diet in America in the 50s and 60s. So that helps protect the breast tissue all by itself. Vitamin D, a paper out of Hopkins showed vitamin D above 60 decreases recurrent breast cancer 300%. So it's just not one thing. Remember, estradiol and testosterone, in fact, there's more testosterone receptors that are in breast tissue than estrogen, but estradiol, testosterone, progesterone protect a young breast. Remember, those who get most breast cancers other than the 5% of genetic, the BRCA, is in a post-menopausal state when their estradiol is zero. And the papers out of um, oncology schools are uh, thought is even those with BRCA, um, it's, it's the benefits to take the hormones because it protects it from dementia and cardiovascular disease, which kills us, not the breast cancer per se. As always, fascinating. So well, what are your five takeaways today? Uh, I do the same thing, Jim. The five takeaways, I just, it gets, it gets so much, but it really is knowledge and it's not... It's out there. And I think we should question your your provider because your provider is providing you. You are the one in charge of your body. Ask questions, get conflicting responses, get second opinions, uh, get tertiary opinions, uh, read, study, watch things and ask questions. And if your doctor says, because I told you so, I would change doctors. I think it's important to always ask questions and why. And uh, again, you and I had this conversation, if we had this conversation 20 years ago, I'd be just the opposite. Bioidentical is no different than synthetic, don't worry about it, da, 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 da. Uh, but I, I've, I've over mine, I've changed, I've seen it. I can't be any clearer. It's in my wife and me before I place anybody else. It was in us. So I think the data, so the takeaway is always be your own, be your king and queen, be in charge, ask questions. Uh, your health is your best, the most important asset you have is your health. Um, and I really want people to enjoy life with that freedom they have. So Jim, I know it's, it's not, that's only four, but the bottom line is please guys, do your reading, do your studies and get conflicting response. Read pro cholesterol, beat anti, read them all. Do it. Your body's more important. 
Don't watch Bravo. Study this. And just for our audience, we treat, what, 55% female, 45% male? Uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. And our ages, it, it, our ages are 18, but I think 92 is our oldest. And, um, and the reason why the younger people are because they've been bombarded in the womb. But um, the key is we treat symptoms. Uh, we don't treat numbers, but we have numbers as a guidepost. And again, Jim, what's very interesting is we're never anybody's first doc to see, right? It's they've tried this, they've went for years, or we're the last resort, we're this. That's how they come to us, they're searching. And that's why I believe our job at Optimal Bio is to educate, not to pellet. That's tertiary. Yeah, and it kind of works in reverse because you're the last resort, and then when they start going to you, they don't have to see the other doctors as much anymore. I, I, I think so. We're not the primary care, but the that's the goal. And then and then you find, like, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a great paper in the NIH showing that anxiety and depression is treated best by testosterone. About 50, 60% of our patients, and we were, we were close to a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists here, and we also work with PTSD, uh, our military, about 50, 60% of these men and women are off most of their medications in four to six months by getting their testosterone, their estrogen, the vitamin D, um, their probiotics, uh, their fish oil, all things that help the brain stronger. Uh, Again, not anti the medication. There's people that need it, but not 70% of us don't need it. So there's ways to lower doses or remove some to get some more benefits on this. Again, the cells are amazingly, could do a lot of things if they're, if they're optimally at these youthful levels. As always, information is great, and we appreciate your time again. So thank you, doctor. Thank you, my friend. And again, really, guys, don't, don't really take what we say. I'm glad you, you come to us and look at this stuff, but the onus... Liberty is a verb. You got to take action. Don't be passive. Be, be, be asking questions and understand how important it is to ask questions and to search for something because nobody knows your body better than you. These symptoms are just not nuisances. They are warning signs that something's happening inside. Great advice. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you, everybody. This has been a production of Optimal Bio. Optimal Bio is CEO Tyler Brandon, podcast host and partner Jim Baker, medical director Greg Brandon, production assistance by Core Media, Beth Grabencourt, administrator, Kevin Duthu, executive producer. The podcast can be found on our website, optimalbio.com, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Our theme song is Sunwave by Paradiso, provided by Epidemic Sound. Thank you.